Hi everyone, welcome to the Psych 3-4 lecture as part of our September lecture series. Um, so we'll be doing a nice recap today, review on everything this year, everything on Unit 3 and Unit 4 in preparation for your upcoming exam. Um, before I would like to begin the lecture, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm presenting from today, so the people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So you guys may have watched a couple of ATAR Notes lectures before, or you may be pretty familiar with the site. Um, essentially, we run these lectures a couple times a year, giving you a little sort of concise review, um, you know, of psychology, a lot of other different subjects as well. In terms of the resources that are available on the ATAR Notes site, there are a lot more beyond the lectures. So you've got, you know, your study notes, um, lots of discussion forums, things like that, ATAR calculators, which are pretty popular around this time of the year, especially for you guys that are in year 12. Um, if you are interested at in seeing, you know, some more ATAR notes things, obviously covering VCE, but also covering stuff beyond that. So, you know, tertiary education, that sort of thing. Um, feel free to head to the website and to have a little look at that. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, we're doing a nice cover of both unit three and unit four. Um, so this is what we're looking at today. So we're going through the first part, which will be your neurotransmission, your stress, so your unit three stuff. The second half of the lecture will be your sleep and mental well-being, but we'll also have some discussion on your scientific skills, which are also really, really important, um, and some kind of brief stuff on exam advice. We will go through this quite quickly, as I'm sure you guys are aware, psych is a very big subject. There's a lot of content. So we're squeezing a lot of stuff into two hours. So I'll go through it at a pretty quick pace. Um, if you don't grab anything, the slides are available, you're available to, you're able to watch the video, um, you know, beyond the lecture series, you can catch up and stuff like that. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. My email is just my name. So lodez at tutesmart.com. I'll mention it again at the end of the video and I'll pop it into chat. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions on anything, don't worry about getting it in the video. Feel free to email me or feel free to just watch the video again, um, and catch up. Okay, so um, before we do start with the content in terms of who I am, so as I mentioned, my name's Luz. Um, I graduated a couple years ago now, so I'm in my third year of uni. I did psych when I was in year 11, and I think I'll mention this again when I go through exam tips, but that's something to bear in mind. I know psych 3-4 um, is a pretty popular subject, I would say, to do as like an early 3-4. I know some of you guys might be in year 11 as well. Um, but it is a pretty popular subject in general, which can be a good thing and a bad thing. Again, I'll talk about it when we get to exams. Um, but yeah, I got a 50 in psych. Um, I think it was, it was my favorite subject in year 11. Um, one of my favorite subjects in, you know, amongst all the ones that I did. I think it's interesting. And obviously you guys do have a new study design this year, but most of the stuff is the same. I think things that helped me was I would be interested in what I was studying. Obviously that's, you know, you either like psych or you don't. But I think if you can try and figure out um, when you're studying it, I used to just apply it to myself, if that makes sense. Like when you think about memory, when you think about learning, when you think about stress, when you think about sleep, it's all stuff that's relevant to you. So every time I was studying, I think about, you know, I'm learning about memory. Oh, like this is happening in my memory right now. Or when I was learning about sleep, I would think about, you know, oh yeah, this is relevant. You know, I can imagine um you know times where I've dreamt this or you know when you feel sleepy later at night your melatonin that sort of thing um so I think that is something that helped me and I guess if you you know if psych is maybe not one of your favorite subjects that might help you a bit in sort of kind of motivating you to learn just try and apply yourself I don't know that's what helped me a little bit um but yeah any questions about uni or about VC in general you know handling other subjects that sort of thing feel free to pop those in the chat as well. Okay, um, so we'll begin with our idea of neurotransmission. So we have this nice overview of our nervous system. So remember your nervous system in general is just this kind of collection of nerves, how we communicate, how your body basically interprets information that comes from your environment or from the outside or from other areas in your body how your brain processes that response to that and initiates a response. That's the general sort of system that we're looking at here. So the main thing that I would always think about when I thought of the nervous system was just communication. Everything is based on this idea of communication. 
Um, so you've got your human nervous system, which is your sort of bigger umbrella. And then that splits into your central and your peripheral. So your central nervous system, very easy to remember. It's literally just your spinal cord and your brain. Um, so you can imagine that's pretty important. Hence why it's in the center. Um, I'll say this again as we go through the lecture, but lots of definitions in psych, it's very much in the name. So if you can remember the name, um, or if you can sort of understand the meaning of the name, that helps you a lot in terms of remembering what it actually involves. So central nervous system, think in the center of your body, peripheral, you're thinking about, you know, the nerves in your limbs on the periphery. Um, so as I'm mentioning central nervous system, your brain and your spinal cord, that, you know, the importance of your brain is really to do with that coordinating response and then sending one out. Your periphery um, or your peripheral nervous system, that's important for sort of registering the response so that initial sort of sensory information that goes towards the brain and then also um, initiating the response. So once you've gotten the information from the brain, it sends it back out to your peripheral nervous system. Um, and so your kind of efferent neurons, they figure out that um, action that you're supposed to do. In splitting that up further, you've got your peripheral nervous system, which goes into your autonomic and your somatic. So again, kind of in the name, somatic refers to soma, refers to the body. So somatic, you think of things like your voluntary skeletal muscle movement. So when you're running, when you're walking, that kind of thing. Uh, and also important to remember is that sensory input. So when you, you know, like right now I can feel the table or I can feel the temperature, you know, in the room on my hands because of the neurons or the sensory neurons or the sensory receptors that, are, that form part of my somatic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system is sort of more your organs, um, the automatic processes. So again, think about autonomic, automatic. Um, so if you think about, you know, your heart rate, your respiratory rate, your, um, you know, secretion of hormones, that sort of thing, things that you don't voluntarily think about, that's to do with your autonomic nervous system. And then that autonomic nervous system splits further into your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. And these are really important when we talk about stress, um, which we'll get to. But your autonomic nervous system, again, remember that it's all not something that you voluntarily think about, voluntarily think about, sorry. So your sympathetic is basically activating the body. Your parasympathetic is calming it down. Um, so your sympathetic, again, stuff that you associate with stress, you know, your fight or flight or freeze response. Um, you think about sort of getting the body a little bit more active and this idea of preparing it for something, as we see with the flight or fight or freeze response. Um, whereas your parasympathetic is sort of once that your body is activated, you know, once it's in that really high state of arousal, calming it down to kind of, you know, lowering your heart rate, that sort of thing, sort of counteracting the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and I like to think about those two sort of like a little seesaw. So, you know, one is more active than the other, but they're not, it's not like a switch that's on or off. Um, but again, we'll talk about that when we get to the stress response, but hopefully this makes sense. It's a really, really important foundation of this entire area of study. Um, so really important to understand it and to also know what breaks into what. So understand that you've got your peripheral nervous system which splits, you know, one of those divisions is your autonomic and one of those divisions is your sympathetic and parasympathetic. That's really important because often in VCAR questions, they'll ask you, you know, refer to these two divisions or subdivisions. So it's important that if they're making a big hint that they're talking about the somatic nervous system, um, that you're referring to the somatic nervous system as a subdivision of the peripheral nervous system, and you're not associating the somatic nervous system with the central nervous system, for example, or the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so yeah, just kind of memorize this little diagram and when you can think about when something splits into something else. All right. So here's a really nice table that summarizes the differences between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic. Again, sympathetic is activating parasympathetic calming down. So it's this idea about survival kind of, again, you think about that with your stress response. So your pupil dilating, so light can enter the eye. So then you can see better. You can see how that is you know, sort of an adaptive thing and that will help you survive in the case of something stressful um, or like an immediate threat. You know, your lungs, this idea of increasing the breathing rate, your heart rate increasing, pumping blood around. The idea, the thing that I used to think of with the sympathetic and that helped me with some of the things on the table um, is this idea that you are trying to energize the body. You're wanting to send oxygen. You're wanting to send glucose to the muscles in the body. That's your main priority. So when you think about 
increasing the breathing rate, getting the oxygen in, you know, increasing the heart rate, pumping more blood around to carry that oxygen. Um, this idea of, you know, liver and these kind of um, hormones that we'll get to, this increased secretion of glucose, it's sort of sending everything to the muscles so that they've got enough energy so they can, you know, fight or flight basically. Um, but yeah, remember all these things because they can be covered in your, particularly your multiple choice. Um, I say that because it's obviously in short answer, but with your short answer, they'll ask you to name like two or three changes. So go for the easy ones, you know, go for the pupils, go for the heart, go for the lungs. But um, yeah, I say this in terms of multiple choice because, you know, there might be something about the bladder in multiple choice. There might be something about the stomach, which are typically your harder ones to remember than like the heart, for example. Um, so yeah, try to expose yourself to as many multiple choice questions as you can covering this sort of thing. And then essentially parasympathetic is just the opposite. Um, so yeah, that's the main thing. You're sending everything to the muscles. And so you're diverting resources away from other things. And that's the idea of the stomach and the gallbladder. Those slow down because when you're faced with a threat, you're not really thinking about digesting food. Um, that's the idea. Okay. So in terms of neurotransmission, so again, we're thinking about the core sort of basis of this area of study being communication of neurons. So this is really, really important when you think about those divisions of the nervous system that we've just discussed. Um, so you have to be aware about certain parts of a neuron. So understanding the idea of your dendrites, thinking about your axon terminals, that sort of thing, you know, your synapse, um, the emphasis on this compared to sort of your old study design, um, is that you don't have to know every single part of a neuron, you know, like your myelin, you don't really have to worry about that sort of thing. Um, VCAR in this study design really want you to focus on the components that are involved with this synaptic transmission. Um, so the sort of simple idea of this is you've got the end of your presynaptic neuron. So again, very much in the name, your presynaptic and your postsynaptic. And then this little gap is your synapse, your synaptic gap, your synaptic cleft. You'll hear it described a couple of different ways. Um, but you've got at the end of your presynaptic neuron. So this thing is going to send the message. You've got your axon terminals. Um, so again, in the name, so your axon is this long thing that sends the impulse through. So the terminal, the end of your axons, um, they hold these little vesicles that contain your neurotransmitters. So in these little vesicles, you've got your neurotransmitters. They basically um, attached to the end of this axon terminal or terminal button, and then they will secrete neurotransmitters and those will diffuse across this little gap. So they'll just float through. And remember that this basically contains a little message and then those will bind to your receptors. So that should make sense. You've got a molecule and then you've got a receptor, right? It's just like, I don't know, a phone and a voice or something like that, whatever. But the idea is that, you know, you've got something, it binds to your receptor, you're receiving that information it's important that you remember that your receptor is on the dendrite of your postsynaptic neuron. So neurons are all the same. They all, oh, well, for the purpose of Psych 3-4, they're all the same. They all look like this. And just think of your neural pathways, it's these in a row. Like they're all in a row. Um, and you've got, you know, your presynaptic and then your postsynaptic. And then down here, this will be the presynaptic there will be, you know, another synapse and then a postsynaptic, so on and so forth. And that's how you pass a message down through multiple neurons. Um, so it's important to remember that, you know, every neuron's got dendrites, every neuron's got axon terminals, but use, you have to use your vocabulary carefully um, because if you're referring to dendrites, you know, on a presynaptic neuron, that would technically be incorrect for the purpose of your synaptic transmission because you've got your receptors sitting on your dendrites of your postsynaptic neuron remembering that the role of your dendrites is basically to receive information. So this neuron will then receive the information. The neurotransmitter will have whatever effect it has, depending on, you know, what type of neurotransmitter it is. And then an impulse will be sent down this one's axon, go through to the axon terminals. And again, the same process will repeat and it'll pass the message on to the next neuron. Um, so yeah, that's essentially the sort of simple run through of neurotransmission, but just important to know what parts of the dendrite you need to know when you're discussing this process. Um, and yeah, how it kind of works in your presynaptic, postsynaptic communication. All right. So we've discussed neurotransmitters briefly. Then you've got your two examples of your 
sort of excitatory and your inhibitory neurotransmitters. So remembering your glutamate, very much involved with learning and memory. So you'll likely see, you know, you can kind of cross between these two areas of study. So glutamate is excitatory. So therefore it's kind of involved with this long-term potentiation. So remembering that long-term potentiation is your increase in synaptic strength. So you're um, basically increasing the strength of these connections of these neural pathways. So just like what we're discussing here, um, if you constantly send glutamate, if these neural pathways are revisited over and over and over, your brain basically registers like, oh, okay, I think this is a pretty important neural pathway because I'm using it a lot. Let's make it stronger. And so it does that by you know, increasing the number of transmitters released, increasing the number of receptors that are released. It basically increases the sensitivity of the postsynaptic neuron to messages from the presynaptic neuron. It's like telling, um, I don't know, it's like telling someone on the phone, like, wait for my call, like I'm on a call soon or something like that, um, because your brain realizes like, oh, this neural pathway is going to be used a lot. Let's make sure that the neurons that are part of this neural pathway um, are like really tight. As opposed to your GABA, which is the opposite, kind of involved with long-term depression. Um, or I should, yeah, could say, you know, less long-term potentiation. Its role is to do the opposite of glutamate. So it inhibits um, sort of the firing of your postsynaptic neuron. So your glutamate, you think about, um, you know, the more you send these um, messages through your neural pathways, you know, glutamate's being sent, you're increasing the strength. With GABA, if you're sending GABA, you're basically telling the next neuron um, sort of calm down, you know, don't send these messages to the other neurons that are waiting for you. Just relax a little bit. It's inhibiting the impulses that are going to be sent through that neuron. So you can see that that could lead to a decrease in long-term potentiation because if I send a GABA to the neuron next to me, the neuron next to me is basically less likely to fire to maybe it's neurons that it might usually fire to. So that's that idea of your decreasing the strength. Um, and the purpose of long-term depression is this idea of your brain realizing what synapses or what neural pathways are irrelevant or unnecessary or are becoming a little bit useless. You know, just like the opposite of long-term potentiation, your brain is realizing, okay, I'm not using this neural pathway much. Let me just weaken it a little bit. You know, I don't have to focus on it too much. Um, basically, it's not worth the resources is that kind of idea. Okay, so dopamine and serotonin, these are also examples of neurotransmitters, but they are also what we'd call neuromodulators. So neuromodulators, they can basically, um, again, they are neurotransmitters. So they've got all those properties or characteristics that we've just discussed before. But neuromodulators are a little bit different because they're also able to work on synapses that are a little bit far away and they can work on synapses in a more general term in that they can change sort of the effect of neurotransmitters that are passing through that synapse. Um, hence the term neuromodulators. So they can sort of modulate, you know, increase, decrease the activity of, um, you know, these synapses of the neurotransmitters crossing through them, that sort of thing. And again, they can work on neurons that are a little bit further away. So dopamine is one that we think about. Um, dopamine covers a lot of different things. I'm sure, you know, before you guys started psych, you would have heard of the term dopamine. It's very commonly involved with like discussions on addiction. You know, often when you talk about gambling, it's always this idea of dopamine, dopamine. Um, so it's involved with this idea of rewarding behaviors. Um, so that's kind of why it's involved with this idea of addiction and this, um, sort of like excitement hit or like positive hit when you're rewarded and that kind of precipitates the desire to do it again, that sort of thing. Um, but it's also really important in things like balance involved in movement. Um, you know, you guys might be aware of the disease Parkinson's disease. Like it's very important in that. Um, Parkinson's disease is also something that is covered on an earlier study design. So you don't need to worry about it. So if you see some kind of resources that cover Parkinson's, um, you don't need to discuss dopamine in that context for this study design. Vika just wants you to understand dopamine as an example of a neuromodulator. Something kind of special with dopamine is that it can have excitatory and inhibitory effects. Um, serotonin is more so solely like inhibitory, whereas dopamine is, um, yeah, can be both. Serotonin, um, you think about yeah, it's often called like the feel good hormone. Like you think about it, um, you know, like the happy hormone, that sort of thing. So it's levels basically um, 
yeah, determine mood, that sort of thing. But it's also very important in sleep. So it might come up in the context of sleep. You don't need to know, you know, it's specific action. Same with dopamine. You don't need to know specific synapses that it acts on, that sort of thing, or areas of the brain. Um, but just understanding that, you know, it can affect sleep as a neuromodulator because maybe it affects neural pathways that are involved in sleep and the other neurotransmitters that are important in sleep, that sort of thing. Um, okay, so again, the sort of process long-term potentiation, long-term depression. Um, you can talk about it in the context of synaptic plasticity. So the principle of plasticity, again, very much in the name, is the brain's ability to basically change in response to different experiences, in response to learning, that sort of thing. So again, these three terms are very much in the name. I'm probably going to say that a lot as we go throughout this lecture, but sprouting. You're thinking about this little diagram that we have here on the left, forming sort of new neural connections, um, creating new neural pathways. So if a neuron is sprouting, you know, the dendrites kind of branching out a little bit more. Um, rerouting is when you think about, you've got one sort of synaptic pathway, but then, you know, for whatever reason, the brain may say, you know, oh, this isn't the best pathway or, you know, we're not using this pathway anymore. Let's divert this neuron or this um, synapse to sort of find somewhere else. So that's that idea. Um, yeah, and it can often be this idea of damaged neurons, you know, damaged pathways further down. But for whatever reason, your brain basically adapts, again, this idea of plasticity and realizes, okay, like I've got this one, you know, shonky neuron. It's okay, I'm just going to use a synapse somewhere else. Um, and then pruning is basically the opposite of sprouting. So, you know, you think about long term depression with this a lot. Um, Pruning is this idea of if these synapses aren't being used, these neural pathways aren't being, you know, fired, messages aren't passing through, pruning occurs. And again, it's the brain's idea, the brain's way of going, um, you know, I've got these neural pathways in my brain, but I'm not using them. They're basically taking up space. Let me get rid of them. And then maybe I can, you know, have another neural pathway that I am using go there instead. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. All right, we'll do a quick um, practice question or three. So Lily was sitting with her school friends in a grassy area during lunchtime when a bug started crawling up her leg. Before she realized what it was, she swiped it away with her hand. So this is something that we haven't discussed sort of in detail yet, but thinking about these terms, you're going to want to highlight words that you see. You can see that the prompt isn't very long, but there are important parts of this question that tell you what's going on. So Lily's response is an example of, so I guess based on where this is in our lecture, you can tell that it won't be counter shock and it won't be fight, flight, freeze, um, you know, counter shock being part of gas, your general adaptation syndrome. So we're thinking about a conscious response to sensory stimuli or a spinal reflex. These two are often confused a little bit um, on exams and among students. An important thing that we see here is before she realized what it was, um, so you remember what I said earlier about, you know, the brain and the spinal cord, this idea of your central nervous system, you consciously think of something, you consciously coordinate a response and then you initiate it. That's what we would see in a conscious response to sensory stimuli. So, you know, I see a little bug crawling on my hand or something like that. Um, my afferent neurons, so my sensory neurons, they, they go to my you know spinal cord, which goes to my brain. My brain registers like, oh, okay, there's a bug on my hand. Like, I don't really like that. It's making me a bit uncomfortable. You know, it's not like survival instinct or anything like that, but it's just, oh, there's something on my hand or maybe like a blade of grass. I should make it something like less terrifying. Um, but, you know, let me, me move my hand or let me brush this little thing off. So the brain is going to register it and then it's going to say, okay, oh, I want this little sort of uncomfortable stimuli off my hand. We're going to send an efferent um, or sort of like a motor impulse through to our, you know, motor neurons. And then they will, you know, work on the skeletal muscles in my right hand or maybe the muscles in my left arm to move it away or to flick it off. So that idea of it being really conscious um, before she realized what it was. That's what tells us that this is a spinal reflex. It's an unconscious response. It's involuntary because as we know, in a spinal reflex, um, you're not involving the brain in the actual reaction, obviously it's involved a bit later, but you're thinking about your sensory neuron, your interneuron in your spinal cord, and then your motor neuron. That's your spinal reflex or your spinal or your reflex arc. Um, so that's what we can see here before she realized what it was. As it goes through the spinal cord and, you know, as it's going back simultaneously, we're getting this 
sort of impulse this message up to the brain and then the brain will register like, oh, okay, like that's what I've just done. Um, but initially the brain isn't involved and that's why it's a reflex. It happens very quickly um, and it basically saves time. So which division of Lily's nervous system is responsible for integrating and coordinating her response to the bug? So we know this is a spinal reflex, but seeing the term kind of integrating and coordinating her response, that should tell you that it's central because your peripheral is just basically to send and receive messages. Remember the importance of your brain, the importance in this case of your spinal cord, um, coordinating that response. Which division of the nervous system is responsible for conveying the afferent information to the spinal cord? So remember, we've got our reflex art. We've got our, our little acronym SAME is really good. Um, so sensory afferent, that's coming in. And then motor efferent, so that's going out. Think about what we talk about when we think about those um, neurons. When we were discussing initially, you've got your peripheral nervous system, you've got your autonomic, and you've got your thematic. So think about, um, you know, when you think about your autonomic nervous system, think about very much your organs and your somatic, as we talked about before, your voluntary skeletal muscle movement um, and your sensory reception. Remember how we talked about this idea of feeling the cold temperature in my hand, that sort of thing. Your sensory receptors, your afferent receptors, that's what's going to detect that. So that's part of the somatic. Um, parasympathetic, this isn't part of your auto autonomic nervous system. Um, receiving sort of sensory information, again, like the table touching my hand, like the temperature, um, you know, like the clothes against my skin, that sort of thing. That's part of your somatic. That's not part of your autonomic. Autonomic sensory information would be more so things with like, you know, like what's happening in your gut or something like that. Um, that's what we're thinking about there. And then so the brain and central, obviously they're part of, part of something else. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, moving on to stress. So we've got your flight or fight or freeze response. Um, remember that this is very involved with your sympathetic and your parasympathetic, and that's the table we saw before. And again, just what I was saying about your autonomic nervous system being automatic. That's why it's this idea of your involuntary response. You don't think about, okay, time to turn my sympathetic nervous system on, time to you know switch my parasympathetic off. Your autonomic nervous system coordinates it involuntarily. Um, so it's very much this idea of an acute sort of immediate stress response. So you see an initial threat. Um, and again, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this, the feeling that you get when you're initially faced with something stressful. Um, so this idea of think about that table of your sympathetic nervous system, you've got your heart rate increasing, your breathing rate increasing, your pupils dilating, all that sort of thing. Um, so that's what you're going to be feeling. You know, you might be feeling palpitations. You might notice yourself hyperventilating, that sort of thing. So that's your flight or your fight because you're running somewhere or you're, I don't know, confronting something, combat, all that sort of thing. So it makes sense that you need to activate your body and do everything we discussed in terms of your muscles and that sort of thing. Whereas with your freeze response, um, your parasympathetic, yeah, parasympathetic nerve system is more dominant. So again, think about it like that seesaw. They're both on, but one's just more so than the other. So your sympathetic is more on than the other in your flight or fight. And then in your freeze, your parasympathetic is more on, which is why you get those sort of, sort of like odd um, symptoms, I suppose, in terms of, you know, your blood pressure might drop initially, your muscles freeze up, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the questions you get on this, I mean, psych in general, you get a lot of scenario-based questions, but fight, flight, freeze, your multiple choice, you know, might be like what's, you know, your sympathetic nervous system doing and you choose heart rate or breathing rate or stuff with the stomach, that sort of thing. Um, but in your short answer, you'll have to do obviously a bit more of a lengthy explanation and you'll have to discuss sympathetic dominance. You know, you might have to discuss parasympathetic dominance. It'll ask about, you know, the purpose of your fight and your flight, the purpose of your freeze and that sort of thing. Um, so in general, you want to be thinking about these, making your clear statement, always referring to the scenario. This goes for all your site questions, always include their name and being really specific. So don't just mention heart rate, breathing rate, you know, saliva, the bladder, the liver. Um, if there's nothing mentioned about, you know, a really fast breathing rate in the scenario, make sure you're being very specific to what's being described in front of you. And you're not just sort of rote learning answers and applying them to every single scenario. 
Okay, so that's sort of our acute stress response. In our more chronic stress response, we get this involvement of cortisol. So cortisol can still be released quite initially in your sort of phase of stress. With your flight, fight or freeze, you think more so about like adrenaline, that sort of hormone. Um, and in your chronic stress response, you think more so like high levels of cortisol. Um, so the purpose of cortisol is, again, you're thinking about mobilizing sources of glucose. So that's the sort of thing. It kind of energizes the body, ramps up the body. So if you're faced with a stress response for a long period of time, initially that's great. However, the sort of downside of cortisol is that it will suppress the immune system if it's released in high amounts for a long period of time, which is why after sort of longer bouts of stress, those high cortisol levels will lead to people getting sick. So often, um, you know, in year 12, like during SAC week, sometimes during the exam period, even you start to get, you know, those coughs and colds that you might not typically get. Um, and often it's because, you know, if you're in a bit of a higher state of stress, that cortisol is flowing around your body's ability or the strength of your immune system ultimately has decreased a little bit. This diagram we've got here is our HPA axis. You don't need to know the intimate details of this, like acetylcholine, that sort of thing. You don't really need to worry about it too much. Um, you have to understand that the HPA axis ultimately results in cortisol and you also need to understand its involvement in the gut brain axis, but you just don't need to know the super specific intimate details of it. Um, these are just more of an FYI, but yeah, just understand that there is this sort of organization, this sort of um, coordination, you know, that message from the brain that, okay, we're dealing with this stress for a little bit longer. It's becoming a bit more of a chronic problem. Let's ramp the cortisol up or, you know, let's keep this cortisol going. Um, and then that can kind of lead to, as we'll talk about in the gas model, that sort of exhaustion. Okay. So the gut brain axis, as I was mentioning, involves the HPA axis, you know, that sort of level of cortisol. Um, and it involves a lot of other stuff. So your central nervous system, you've got the divisions of your autonomic um, and this other division of your autonomic called the enteric. So enteric just has to do with like your intestines, with your gut. Um, so it obviously makes sense in this context. So the gut brain axis, just the, basically the connection between your gut and your brain, their communication, their coordination of responses. Um, obviously we're discussing the gut brain axis in the specific context of stress. So that's what you need to be comfortable sort of describing it in. Um, so that's why, you know, kind of talking about the HPA axis and that release of cortisol, that's why it becomes very relevant. And it's discussion on your sympathetic and your parasympathetic, you know, with the knowledge of how that's involved with your stress response as well is very important. It's really important to understand this idea of it being a bi-directional link. Vika are very, um, they put a lot of emphasis on that. So your gut and your brain, they talk to one another and your gut affects your brain and your brain also in turn affects your gut. So it's not just that your brain is telling your gut what to do. And, you know, when things go funny in your brain, things go wrong in your gut. It's also the other way. So when things go wrong in your gut, things can go wrong in your brain. Um, and again, that's just a general thing, but we're focusing on the idea of stress. So when your body is stressed, that can lead to sort of manifestations in your gut. When there's odd things going on in your gut, that can sort of precipitate or exacerbate your stress response as well. Um, something important to realize is this idea of the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is just this nerve that basically allows um, the communication between your gut and your brain. Ultimately, um, a lot of it is essentially towards the brain. So in this vagus nerve in particular, a lot of the communication that we think about is from the gut through to the brain. But you're also remembering that there's other ways in terms of your brain communicating to your gut. Um, but yeah. That's an example of thinking about nerves and, our, and their involvement in this sort of communication between the brain and other parts of the body. So in terms of the gut, when we're talking about the gut, we talk about the bacteria, the other microorganisms that float around in there. You know, they are sometimes referred to as our flora or our microbiota. It's just that collection of bacteria and other organisms that sit in there. Um, and ultimately the variety of gut bacteria that you've got in there, the number of gut bacteria is really important. And you want to keep that at a nice balance. And when that balance sort of goes a bit wrong or what we might call dysbiosis, um, that obviously has detrimental effects on your gut itself. But then, you know, given our understanding of the GBA, that can affect our brain, can affect our stress response as well. So um, a key example of this 
is that the bacteria in your gut, they're involved in producing a lot of important hormones, a lot of important neurotransmitters. These include ones we've talked about, you know, GABA, dopamine, serotonin, that sort of thing. So if you've got this dysbiosis, you know, your bacteria are going a little bit funky, your levels of important hormones, of important neurotransmitters and your neuromodulators, that's being thrown out of whack. And then so you can see how that will affect your brain. Um, And then sort of on the flip side, if you've got a lot of stress going on, you know, things that are going wrong in your brain, um, that can basically lead to odd things going on in your gut that can decrease the, you know, healthy microbiota and throw that balance out of whack as well. Okay, so thinking about our two sort of models of stress, you've got your general adaptation syndrome, which is very biological, and then our transactional model, which is more so psychological. So remember that and think about the strengths and weaknesses of that as well. Like gas is very, very focused on physiological responses, but it sort of underplays or undermines the psychological response and vice versa with your transactional model. So I'm sure you guys have seen this graph a gazillion times, but you really have to remember it. It's important and it helps you when you're explaining as well. So you've got this stage of alarm. So it's this initial reaction to your stressor. So you've got shock and this is, um, you know, it seems counterintuitive, but it's when your body is literally just like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on. And your ability to deal with this stressor, it basically decreases, um, So that's when you can sort of find, you know, sometimes people faint, that sort of thing. And your body is just in this, it's almost overwhelmed by the stressor, but then the body basically gets over, over that and goes, okay, sympathetic nervous system, you know, do your thing, your heart rate increases, that sort of stuff. And then that's what we call counter shock, your body's ability or your body's response kind of ramping up. And you can see how this then increases above the typical um, ability to deal with a stressor resistance is when, you know, that stressor isn't dealt with, it becomes a bit of a long-term thing. Um, and it's your body, you know, you've got cortisol floating around here a lot. And just as the name suggests, you're resisting it. You can see that you've got a really great ability to deal with the stressor. It's far above normal. Um, and yeah, you're just kind of dealing with that stress on a more chronic time scale. Um, but the issue with that, as we discussed, is that cortisol. So that means that during this period, um, you're going to feel a little bit, you know, you might be predisposed to getting your coughs and colds, your sort of minor illnesses. Um, but if the stressor is dealt with during this period, okay, cool. It's fine. However, if the stressor lasts beyond this, it gets into some really long-term stress, your body just can't cope with it anymore. Like your body can't sustain floating at this level forever. Eventually it's going to deplete all its resources and going to come crashing down ultimately. Um, so the body just gets exhausted. You know, it's been trying to energize and ramp itself up for too long. So now is when you're going to get your sort of more major illnesses. So you can have troubles with your heart. You can have, um, your immune system is weakened a lot more. So you're more susceptible to these coughs and colds and that can turn into pneumonia, these sorts of things. Um, you obviously, you know, and gas is thinking a lot about physiological, but you can think about, you know, the effects of long-term stress as well. You can get some of your, um, mental health disorders, you know, things like depression, that sort of thing, your anxiety disorders, like your more extreme, um, sicknesses here. But yeah, that's what we're thinking about with exhaustion and particularly when our body is decreasing below that ability to sort of fight off our stressor. Um, okay. So with our Lazarus and Fragments, this is our transactional model. So again, in the name, we're kind of having this transaction with our environment. And when you think about transaction, you think a little bit more about, um, conscious decisions or putting thought into it, or this idea of, um, perceiving your situation a little bit more, whereas your gas is your more one size fits all. So if, you and all of your friends face a stressor, you know, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go down and then up and then down. Whereas the transactional model says, you know, we've all got different experiences. Um, we've all got different coping methods and coping resources. We're going to interpret things differently. So you've got your stressor, you do your primary appraisal. You're basically figuring out, um, is this stressful ultimately, you know, is this something that I actually care about? Is this significant? That's your primary appraisal. If you think, okay, this is pretty significant, then you've got your secondary appraisal. And that's when you're thinking, okay, something significant has happened. A, do I have enough resources to deal with it? Or option B, do I not have enough resources ultimately? 
And then that obviously factors in how stressed you feel. Um, so important terms to realize are these kind of six terms here. So you're doing your primary appraisal. There are two ways in which you can, it can be like insignificant. So either it's irrelevant, it doesn't really have any effect on you or it's benign positive. So it's got sort of this ultimately positive effect on you. And the third option is it's stressful. And that's when you go towards your um, sort of secondary appraisal. In this idea of stress, you can also think about, you know, is it something that's kind of affected me in the past? You know, it's harmed me or it's led to a loss and that's why it's stressful. Or, you know, is it something that could be stressful in the future? It poses a threat to me in the future. Or the third one, which is kind of like the one that's like, oh, yeah, you know, you're so positive. Um, do I see it as a challenge? Is this something that I can learn and grow from? Although it still is stressful, but you just perceive it in a bit more of a, I can do this sort of way. Um, so you go to your secondary appraisal. Again, you think about your coping resources, your coping methods. If you deem them as inadequate, that's when you really experience a lot of stress. Um, if you think like, you know, I've got this, 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 like there's no reason for me to feel stressed, then you don't feel stressed. Um, that's obviously a very simplistic explanation of it. Um, but as part of this method of coping, you also discuss your approach and your avoidance coping strategies. Again, very much in the name approach, you're directly confronting the stressor. If I've got a test, I'm studying for it. Um, avoidance coping strategies, I've got a test. I don't want to think about it. It's making me stressed. I'm going to go watch TV. It's just that idea of dealing with something directly or dealing with something indirectly. Okay. Um, on top of that, you've got your two terms, your context specific effectiveness. Again, you already know what I'm going to say. It's in the name. Does my coping strategy match this situation? Is it specific for this context and therefore it's effective? Um, so kind of what we were discussing before, if I've got a test, Studying for this test, that's pretty effective. Whereas, I don't know, if my stressor is my best friend at school and I are having a fight, like studying isn't going to be that helpful. But it's this idea of having a coping strategy that matches what, what the situation at hand is. Um, and very kind of closely tied in with that is this idea of coping flexibility. So if you've got a coping strategy and you realize, okay, it's not working, having the ability to realize that and then use something else, you know, kind of using new coping strategy strategies and trying them out, realizing when situations are different and when one strategy might not work for something else, you're being flexible. Okay. Hopefully that all makes sense with stress moving on to our learning and memory. So you've got your conditioning. So your classical conditioning is when we think about our involuntary associations, you know, between stimuli and your operant conditioning is your more voluntary active learning. Um, so really important to know your three stages and to know your, your sort of key terms. So before conditioning, you've got your unconditioned stimulus. So remember very much in the name, if you understand what an unconditioned stimulus is and an unconditioned response, remembering that conditioning basically means learning. Um, if you've got an unconditioned response, it's an innate response. You haven't learned this response. It's just what you do when you're unconditioned, your automatic response. Um, so if you think about like Pavlov's dogs, your unconditioned stimulus, you've got food. Naturally, instinctively, you salivate in response to food because, you know, physiologically you need saliva, whatever it is. Um, but it's that, that, that idea of your unconditioned stimulus of food producing your unconditioned response of salivation that's what happens naturally. A second little interaction that you have is that your neutral stimulus doesn't do anything. So you present to a dog food, the dog is going to salivate. If you present to a dog a bell, the dog will sit there going, mm, you know, there's no instinctive response that comes in reaction to that. Um, yeah, so that's that idea there. During conditioning, you're going to pair your unconditioned stimulus with your neutral stimulus. So during conditioning, remember you've got your multiple trials um, or your multiple pairings. So you've got your food and you've got your bell and you present them at the same time. Technically, you will present your neutral stimulus a little bit before, but you know, you present them pretty much at the same time. Um, you then, the dog will salivate in response to the food, but while the food is there and while it's salivating, the whole time this bell is ringing in the back, um, so the idea that that 
involuntary or maybe like unconscious association is building deep in their brain. Um, so that's that idea. And you present it multiple times. You're strengthening, you're strengthening, you're building that association. Um, so therefore after conditioning now, because you're always presenting food and the dog is always salivating while there's a bell in the background. Now, when you ring the bell by itself in the dog's brain, it associates the bell with food and therefore salivation. So now when you're ringing the bell, the dog will salivate in response to the bell. And that's your conditioned response with your conditioned stimulus being the bell. It's very important. Your conditioned response and your unconditioned response are the same thing. So you've got your salivation in your short answers. You have to specify what the response is to. So in your unconditioned response, salivation in response to food or salivation, you know, to food, when food's shown, whatever it is. After conditioning, you've got your conditioned response. It's salivation. Salivation in response to the bell. That's what you need to write. If you just write salivation, um, it's incorrect because your examiner, you know, doesn't know what it's in, you know, what it's salivating to or because of. Um, so yeah, very important to finish your responses and to be very specific. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense, but understand it's your three, your three phases and just know, you know, your UCS and your UCR, where that fits in, you know, your UCS and your, um, NS being paired, that sort of thing. Okay. Operant conditioning. It's the same thing. You've got your three phases. You've got your A, B, and your C. So your antecedent, your behavior, your consequence, your antecedent is basically the stimulus that triggers your behavior. Behavior is your behavior and your consequence is, um, the outcome of that behavior. So your antecedent, you can think about it being, yeah, ultimately anything. So if I've got um, a dog again and I tell the dog to sit, the behavior is voluntary. So unlike before, when you're thinking about sort of innate things like salivating, this is voluntary. So the dog will voluntarily sit. Um, so operant conditioning is this sort of system of voluntary behavior and increasing or decreasing the likelihood of that behavior by manipulating the consequence of the outcome. So I want my dog to learn how to sit when I say sit. So I say sit, the dog sits. I really like that. That's great. I'm going to give the dog a reward and that's going to make the dog do it again. If um, I tell the dog sit and the dog runs away, I'm not going to give the dog a reward. Maybe it'll have like timeout or something like that. Um, the dog doesn't like that. The dog will be less inclined to not sit when I say sit again in the future. Um, so. In terms of that, it's really important to understand these terms. VCAR will really highly likely to ask you know, to differentiate it either in a short answer or a multiple choice question. Your positive and your negative, it means to give something or to take something away. It doesn't mean a positive, like a good thing or a bad thing. It means giving something or taking something away. Reinforcement is I'm reinforcing the behavior. I'm going to make this behavior more likely to occur in the future. Punishment is I'm decreasing the likelihood of this behavior to occur again. So your positive reinforcement, I'm giving something that is going to make someone do something again. I'm giving something good. Negative reinforcement, I'm taking away something that is going to want to make someone do something again. I'm going to take something bad away. Positive punishment, I'm giving someone something that's going to deter them from this behavior, I'm going to give them something bad, negative punishment. I'm taking something away that is going to make this person not repeat this behavior. I'm going to take away something good. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, just think about it like it's you. So just think about it yourself. So negative punishment, I'm going to take something away. So think about, okay, someone's going to take something away from me and it's punishment. So I'm going to be less likely to do it again. What would someone take away from me? that I, that would make me not want this to happen again. Something that I love, you know, if someone was to take away my phone after I, I don't know, talked in class, I'm not going to want to talk in class again because I really like my phone. That idea, just like think about it. Like it's you. That's how I kind of went through psych, through everything. I just thought about, you know, it's all about me. It's all about me. All this sort of stuff. I would memorize it by thinking about if I'm in this situation, you know, what would I do or what has happened to me in the past? You know, Oh, I remember that time when my, like mum made me clean the house or whatever. Um, think about it like that.
is a tip that I have. It may work. It may not. Um, okay. And then your observational learning. So your classical conditioning and your operant conditioning, they're more so your sort of behavioral models. Your observational learning is what we're thinking about in more of a, um, like a social context. And that's why we discuss, you know, ways of knowing in the same, um, sort of dot point. So your observational learning, your five steps, you know, you can remember it by like, ah, mister. So you've got your attention, retention, reproduction, your motivation, and your reinforcement very much in the name. So as long as you sort of remember, um, those abbreviations, like then you can kind of remember the steps based on what their name is. So attention, attention, you know, you know what it is. You're paying attention to someone, you're looking at the model and there are things that can influence someone's level of attention. Um, you know, if I like them, if they look like me, um, yeah, if I aspire to be like them, if they've got a high status, that sort of thing. And so the opposite would make me less inclined to pay attention to them. Um, your retention, you're retaining information. So you're forming this mental representation. You're basically memorizing what the person is doing. Reproduction, you have the physical ability to reproduce this behavior. They'll often talk about reproduction in the context of, you know, you've got a child and they're trying to do something that an adult's doing. Um, and they'll be like, oh, you know, like what stage has this person failed to meet? Or like, why can't they do this? And it's your discussion on reproduction because, um, they're a child, like maybe they physically don't have the ability to like slam dunk um, or they're, they don't have the mental capability to, I don't know, solve algebra or something like that. Um, motivation, you want to do it. You have a reason to do it. And that is often tied in pretty closely with reinforcement. Um, so maybe you want to do it to impress your friends or to impress your parents. You know, this idea, we talked about reinforcement. Um, you're being sort of rewarded for that behavior. Um, and that's why you want to do it. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Again, you often see children used in those examples. Um, so your ways of knowing kind of ties into this idea of your social context. So rather, um, again, with your operant and your classical conditioning, where it's learning, you know, directly from consequences or that sort of thing, um, those behavioral models, similar to observational learning, it's this idea of learning within a social context and the people around you. Um, so these specific kind of terms that we're going to look at, are more relevant in this idea of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander systems. So these are sort of separate from your more, you know, your Western models of learning. Um, and it's this idea of, you can talk about situated cognition, situated learning theory, but the emphasis here is very much on the learner is in the environment and they're learning in the environment that the things that they're learning are going to be applied, if that makes sense. Um, so you can see this idea here, observing, imitating this idea of observational learning. Um, you've got this sort of less rigid system of learning and this idea here of context specific skills. So rather than, you know, I'm learning this and rote learning this information and, you know, reading these textbooks and whatever, um, it's, you know, I'm trying to learn this skill that's being applied in this environment. I'm going to be put in this environment and I'm going to watch the people around me, you know, kind of performing this skill and I'm going to gain information about this skill. And then I'm going to reproduce this skill based on being within this sort of environment. So that's where the emphasis is in terms of the learner being situated in that environment. Um, and yeah, that's what you can kind of see here. So it's a bit more communal. It's a bit more collaborative than your kind of typical classroom learning basically. Okay, so quick question. Sarah's physical education teacher was demonstrating to the class how to perform a forward somersault. Sarah was motivated to learn how to somersault, but due to her fear of heights, she doubts that she will have the necessary courage to attempt the dive. Sarah's potential inability to attempt the dive is due to which one of the following stages of observational learning? So kind of similar to what I was talking about before. You can go through these. Motivation is the one that's very explicit. Sarah was motivated to learn how to somersault, so you'd immediately chop out C. Um, attention. She's looking at the physical education teacher and if she's motivated to do it, um, you know, you can kind of assume that she's paying attention. There's nothing in here that would suggest that she isn't paying attention. Um, B, retention in terms of memorizing it, memorizing it. Again, the same thing, um, less likely because there's nothing in here to suggest that she's not retaining the information. Whereas D, reproduction, this last sentence, so Sarah was motivated 
but due to her fear of heights, she doubts that she'll have the necessary courage to attempt the dive. So it's that idea of that mental and physical capacity to actually reproduce the behavior. That's what's lacking. So therefore it's D. Um, and again, this is what I talked about. So attention and retention. I mean, there's nothing here to say that she's definitely paying attention or that it's definitely retained, but there's something here that's very explicitly relating to reproduction. Um, so therefore you can kind of assume attention's going on and retention's going on as well. Okay, so looking at our multi-store model of memory, this is very, very important, your atkinson Schifrin model. So you've got your three main stores, so your sensory, your short-term, and your long-term. Your sensory memory, again, very much in the name, your senses, and basically it's flooded with everything that's going on in the environment around you. Um, and your short-term memory, the point is basically to filter it and you're going to pay attention to certain things. And then if you want to, that'll go into long-term memory if it's something you know important that you want to keep in your head, basically. So your sensory memory, just think about everything flooding in. Um, so you can think about your iconic and your echoic. So icon, your things that you're looking at, pictures, you know, eyes, visual stuff. Your echoic, think about an echo, it's your like sounds. Um, so again, sensory memory, everything is flooding in. The capacity is unlimited. So I can look at everything that I want to look at. I can hear everything that's going on, but my brain isn't going to pay attention to it. My brain is very good at filtering out, you know, a lot of stuff in my peripheral vision, like right now, I'm not really focusing on it, right? Because I need to deliver a lecture. I'm not really looking at, you know, oh, what's in this corner of my room? What's in that corner? Um, same with your echoic. If you're maybe at school, right? And you're talking to your friends at lunchtime, there are a lot of sounds that are going on. There are a lot of conversations going on, bells ringing, I don't know, animals screaming, whatever it is. Um, but you can kind of pay attention to what your friend is saying. So that idea of things being in your more short term memory, but your sensory memory, things are still coming in. You're just not paying attention to it. So therefore the capacity is unlimited. You can see as many things as you want. You can hear as many things as you want. What makes your brain not kind of overwhelmed with all this information is the fact that your sensory memory is very, very short. Um, so your iconic is about 0 0.3 seconds, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Um, and the way I used to think of it is like basically like a movie. So, you know, a movie, it's shot by like multiple pictures taken within a really short frame of time and played one after the other. Um, but it looks very smooth, right? That's what is kind of going on with your iconic memory. Like you're looking at things and your brain is taking little pictures of them. But when I move my head, you know, it's all very smooth. It's all very seamless because the duration of them is so short. You can imagine if your iconic memory was three seconds, what I'm looking at now on my screen, if I turn my head to talk to someone, like the screen would be in front of my eyes, if that sort of makes sense. Um, so it wouldn't be that helpful and your brain would like collapse because nobody wants to see that, right? Um, so that's that idea there. I think of it like a little nice movie that makes the world seamless. And that's why it's super, super short. Um, your echoic memory is a little bit longer. So you can sort of understand conversations that are going on. If my echoic memory was super short, um, or if your echoic memory was super short, by the time I'm telling you Atkinson Schifrin multi-store model of memory, by the end of that sentence, you're only remembering the word memory because everything, you know, it's super short and you can't remember the first couple words. That would be useless, right? So that's why it's a little bit longer. Um, yeah, that's how I remembered it. Hopefully it makes sense. Short-term memory, again, your kind of working memory, your conscious memory. It's what you're paying attention to, you know, consciously. Kind of what's sitting at the front of your brain is what I like to think about it as. Um, so your duration, honestly, different resources say different things. But remember, about like 12 to 30 seconds. Sometimes people say 12 to 18 and then like up to 30. I just remember like 12 to 30 seconds. Um, but think about if Vika will be very obvious with it, they won't say like, 25 seconds like oh you know is this in short term memory or is it not they'll say like you know a minute five minutes ten minutes um so just think anything beyond 30 seconds it's probably out of short term memory um and the capacity is very small as well so seven plus or minus two so you've got five to nine items in there um and again it's just because you've got your short term memory your working memory if the duration was longer if the capacity was bigger you'd probably just be a little bit overwhelmed um, but short-term memory is probably what they test the most because they'll talk about, again, something being longer than 30 seconds 
or they'll say so-and-so has to remember a list of like 12 words, you know, short-term memory, how's it going, that sort of thing. That will definitely test your knowledge of duration capacity of your short-term memory. Um, and then your long-term memory, just what it sounds like, this super long-term storage. Um, so again, you say virtually or like potentially unlimited, basically because we don't really know that much about the brain. It's very hard to study memory. Um, so people ultimately assume that your long-term memory can go on forever, but obviously, you know, neurodegeneration happens. People get old, your brain isn't working as well. Um, so that's why it's hard to test how long memory can go on for because, you know, the level that my brain is at now will not be the level that my brain is at when I'm like nine years old. Um, so yeah, that's why I say potentially unlimited. And then same with, um, capacity, like how can you measure, you know, if someone like a limit of the brain ultimately. Um, but yeah, very, very important to know your duration, your capacities. Okay. So your long-term memory splits into, so remember that this is this. So anything to do with sensory and short term has nothing to do with this picture. We're thinking about our long term memory here, the storage of our long term memories. So they're either explicit or implicit. Explicit is that I consciously recall the information from my long term memory. Implicit is I unconsciously or I, it doesn't require conscious recall. And this is your sort of procedural memories or your classically conditioned memories as well. So your explicit is what you focus on a little bit more. Um, episodic is your kind of auto biographical events and like your um your personal memories you know like episodes in your life whereas semantic if you think about the word like you know the semantics it's just facts knowledge um yeah basically that's it of things so the fact that I know you know what a capital city is or that two plus two equals four is your semantic whereas the fact that I know you know I don't know I was wearing like a pink dress on my 11th birthday that's an episodic memory um yeah, or like things like your feelings, your emotions at a time in an episodic memory. That's what you're thinking about there. Um, your procedural memory, so your implicit, the ones that you don't consciously recall, things like walking, brushing your teeth, you know, coordinating movement, hence like procedural, like riding a bike. You don't consciously think like, okay, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this every time you ride a bike. You know, you don't consciously think, okay, I have to go here, I have to go here, I have to go here, I have to hold my arm up, you know, while you're brushing your teeth. Um, so that's why it's procedural and classically conditioned kind of fits under implicit as well, because you don't consciously recall the memory of things that are classically conditioned. All right. Um, so you've got your amygdala and your hippocampus, um, adrenaline or adrenaline, like you don't have to worry about it too much, but amygdala just understand that it's very involved in your emotional memories. Hence why, like, you know, you can sort of think about this association of adrenaline, but it's not too much of a big thing. Um, so don't put too much emphasis on it, but put emphasis on the emotional aspect of things like emotion, fear. It's very associated in your um, amygdala. So kind of these two parts here are probably the most important. The amygdala kind of attaching emotional significance to things and working with the hippocampus to consolidate information. Um, so the amygdala, again, your more emotional stuff, your hippocampus, super important. It's like the main character of this whole thing on memory. Um, very important in consolidating your long-term explicit memories. So your short-term memory, turning that into long-term memory for your explicit memories. That's what it's really important for. Um, so if you've got issues in your hippocampus, and I guess secondarily, if you've got issues in your amygdala, you probably have some issues with consolidating explicit stuff. And that's what you can kind of see in Alzheimer's, which we'll get to um, a really, really, really important point. The amygdala and hippocampus very important with consolidation of memories and that sort of thing, not with storage. They do not store. They're just like little intermediate checkpoints that your memories pass through, but they don't stay there. Where they stay is the neocortex. And this is for your long-term um, explicit memories, your neocortex. So your neocortex is kind of like the outer layer of your brain. Um, so you've got, yeah, your long-term memory is just sitting there all over the brain. Again, your hippocampus, very important with your episodic and your semantic memories, your amygdala, think about emotional kind of fear sort of things. Um, your cerebellum and your basal ganglia, they work together again and they work with the neocortex as well for storage. Um, but they're very important with your implicit memories, particularly your procedural 
So things about like um, your habit formation, some reflexes, stuff like that, really important with your, yeah, your basal ganglia and your cerebellum. Um, so they'll do a lot of encoding, some storage, often you think about like classically conditioned stuff, but they also work with the neocortex and will store some things there as well. All right. Um, so talking about our episodic and our semantic memories, these are really important with our formation of autobiographical events and also this idea of your future thinking and kind of imagined futures. Um, so VCA basically wants you to understand what that is and how that is different for people with Alzheimer's and aphantasia. So again, your autobiographical events, your episodic memory is vital, right? It's basically the like the whole of that. But your semantics are also important because your semantic kind of chucks the fact in. Um, so remembering like what date your 11th birthday was or um, I don't know, maybe like the people there or something like that. Those kind of like facts, like where it was, that sort of thing. Um, so you can see how semantic is still important as part of your autobiographical events. But your episodic is really important because it's your, you know, remembering that those events happened in your own life, that sort of thing. Um, so that's important as well for this idea of episodic future thinking or imagined futures. Basically, it's this idea of autobiographical memories, you know, and events, your episodic memories of your past, they can, um, that kind of contributes to what you think about your future. So when I imagine my future or if I imagine future scenarios, I'm predicting these things based on my own experiences and based on the memories that I have of past sort of episodic events. Um, and so it involves kind of both of these explicit memories, your episodic and your semantic, and it's this ability just to picture, you know, like when you just have your little daydreams and you think about these little scenarios, it's sort of that. Um, so Alzheimer's and aphantasia, those are things that are where it's both like it affects your autobiographical memories. And then so it can affect this idea of having imagined futures. So Alzheimer's is basically this neurodegenerative disease, a type of dementia. So you, um, the main initial symptom is short term memory loss. So again, you can think about it affecting your hippocampus. Um, you have these two little things that are important to remember. So neurofibrillary tangles and amyloid plaques. And the idea of this is that you diagnose these and you see these post-mortem. Um, so Alzheimer's what is what you would call a clinical diagnosis. Like you look at the person and their symptoms, um, and you kind of go, okay, yeah, I think they've got Alzheimer's. It can only 100% be diagnosed, um, post-mortem, like at an autopsy where you're kind of looking at the brain. Um, and in there you will see neurofibrillary tangles and you'll see amyloid plaques. So those are the two kind of like hallmark features of Alzheimer's. Um, but what you need to know, you know, thinking about it in this context is this idea that your long-term memories, particularly your explicit ones, um, are affected. So therefore, if you've got impairment in your episodic and your semantic memories, this idea of memory of your autobiographical events can be hard to recall and your ability to undergo episodic future thinking or this idea of imagined futures will also be impaired. Um, and that's this idea of neurodegeneration and you're kind of like sadly, like losing your memories. Um, whereas aphantasia is a little bit different. So you need to think about the similarities and the differences of Alzheimer's and aphantasia. Aphantasia is basically this disorder where you don't visualize imagery, where you don't think of things like a mental picture um, often. So if you, if I ask you guys, you know, think about your 11th birthday, you probably think about like a picture of yourself, you know, who else was around you. Maybe, I don't know, 11th birthday is hard. Like 11th birthday is a long time ago. Um, but any other sort of episodic, maybe like your 18th or your 17th birthday, um, you know, you think about maybe what you were wearing, you can like see yourself in your outfit, you can see the room and you can see the people around, you can see the cake, whatever. Whereas people with aphantasia, maybe they think about words that describe what the cake looked like. Um, or, you know, they might remember the people's names that were there or yeah, I don't know. They remember like things like that, like more sort of like listing things because they don't visualize they don't see the picture of it in their head if that makes sense um so you can see how autobiographical events will be different and then therefore episodic future thinking like when i think about episodic future thinking you know imagine futures you can think about a picture of yourself you know in that environment whereas aphantasia would be a bit different again maybe this idea is sort of listing things all right so getting toward the end here looking at our mnemonics so the difference that we're looking at here is between our written cultures and our oral cultures. 
So these are our written mnemonics. So you've got your acronyms, your acrostics, your method of loci. So acronyms is basically like when you put the first letters or the yeah first phrases sort of together um, and it forms a pronounceable word. Vika have been, I put an emphasis on this, it has to be something you can pronounce. So like we were talking about with same, sensory afferent, motor efferent, um, or like company names, so like NASA, like it's a pronounceable word. You don't say N-A-S-A, -A, you say NASA. Um, I don't even know what it sounds for. Not a, well, I don't know. Yeah, but you know, NASA, that sort of thing. Um, it's something that you pronounce, whereas if you've got another mnemonic that I can't think of right now, where it's like a letter, like what I just said, like RSPCA, maybe like you don't say like RSPCA, like you say RSPCA. Um, so that isn't pronounceable. So that wouldn't be an acronym. Um, acrostics. These are basically phrases that you come up with that have the same letter as the thing that you want to remember. So, you know, when you remember your directions, like never eat soggy wheat bix, they start with N-E-S-W, same as North, East, South, West. Um, your method of loci is a bit of a different one. So this idea of memorizing where things are based on their location. So you basically visualize lists almost. Um, so an example of this might be like if you have to remember a list of things um, or I'm trying to think apply it to school, but I don't know. If you have to remember, yeah, like a list of things, um, you might put them in different corners of the room or you might put them in different locations along your drive. And then when you look at those things, you remember them. So you kind of associate, like I'm associating my cup with eggs or I'm associating my pillow with milk. Let me do a tour around the room and I'm going to remember what I need to have on my shopping list like so while i'm at the shops i'm kind of remembering you know what things look like it's like that thinking about things in terms of location um yeah so those are your written cultures right um your oral cultures so again like acronyms like maybe less helpful in, in your oral cultures you can see how it would be more of a written thing um so an oral culture in oral cultures an example of a mnemonic us uh, is sung narratives um, and song lines are a specific example of that. So sung narratives, again, just what it sounds like, this idea of remembering things by kind of chunking them in a song. Um, so sung narratives, like, you know, you guys can imagine when you remember lyrics to a song, it's pretty easy, right? You remember them maybe like lines at a time, or you remember it based on the tune, based on the intonation, you know, that sort of thing. So it aids memory. Whereas imagine if you had to remember the lyrics of a song with no rhythm and just written out. Um, so that's the idea here. You you sing something to basically help you remember it a little bit better. Um, so song lines, again, are a specific example that are used by Aboriginal people um, as a form of a sung narrative. So song lines specifically, it's this idea of tracing journeys and describing how a traveler kind of makes a journey across land or across country. Um, so you'll describe landmarks as part of that. You discuss landmarks in the song. Um, and then as part of that song narrative, as you make that journey, again, kind of enhances that memory of that travel. And so you know where you're going. That is a sort of idea there. All right. Quick question. Which of the following memory stores has the lowest capacity? So I think capacity. We're not talking about duration. We're talking about capacity. How many items we can hold in here? Long term, we know that that's unlimited. Short term, it's about five to nine. Iconic and echoic, remember our capacity, everything. We can see everything we want to. We can hear everything we want to. Um, it's just what we pay attention to. So short term has the lowest capacity because the rest are basically unlimited. Okay, going on to part two, we'll go through this one a little bit quickly. I think unit three is a bit heftier than unit four, I would say. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's making sense. So in this area of study, we're talking about sleep. Um, this first slide that we're looking at, we're talking about sleep as a natural altered state of consciousness. So to understand what that means, you have to know what normal waking consciousness is. So generally we refer to people as being in two states, either you're in normal waking consciousness or not, and not equals an altered state of, altered state of consciousness. So your normal waking consciousness, it's hopefully what you guys are right now. You're awake, you're alert, you're pretty aware of, you know, 
your surroundings, you're pretty aware of what you're thinking, you're pretty aware of the time, that sort of thing. An altered state of consciousness is any time where your awareness basically drops. Um, for example, sleep, or you can be in kind of drug-induced altered states of consciousness, um, sometimes, you know, states of daydreaming, like if you're in a coma, obviously. Um, it's yet yeah, any time that you're not in this normal waking consciousness, and often there are always exceptions to the rule, but often you're thinking about um, sort of a decreased state of awareness. And this idea that it can be natural or induced, you guys don't need to know about induced altered states of consciousness, but just understand that sleep is a natural altered state of consciousness because you just drift into sleep. You don't have to stimulate or you don't have to take anything, you know, that makes you sleep, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so figuring out how we measure sleep, you have to use this specific phrasing when you write it. Vika are just very particular about it. Um, the acronym is DARE. So detect, amplify, and record electrical activity of the brain, of the muscles that control eye movements or, you know, muscles. Um, important with your EOG, muscles that control eye movements. Do not say record electrical activity of the eyes. Vika won't accept it um, because you're not detecting the electrical activity of the eyes. You're like, if you've seen someone that's got an EOG, they like put it around here because they're detecting the movement um, or they're detecting the activity, I should say, of the muscles that control your eyes. So obviously when your muscles that control your eyes are move, have high activity, oh my gosh, your eyes are gonna be moving. But if you were to say detect, amplify, and record electrical activity of the eyes, it's implying that you're sticking an electrode on the eyeball um, and you're not. So you don't detect the actual electrical activity of the eyes. It's the muscles that control the eye movements. I don't know. Vika, I'm just very technical about it. Um, so these are your more like objective measures. You know, you hook them up to the electrodes and this is what the electrodes show. Your sleep diary and your video monitoring, they're a little bit more subjective. So your sleep diary, just as it sounds, you chuck in the information about your sleep, what time you went to sleep, you know, if your sleep was disturbed, how you felt when you woke up, what you did in the day that kind of could have contributed to your sleep patterns, that sort of thing. Your video monitoring, you monitor someone on a video as they sleep. Um, so this is, you know, for things where you're suspecting, yeah, like sleepwalking or, you know, issues, like physical issues when you're sleeping that video monitoring can be helpful for. Um, yes. Okay, in terms of your REM and your NREM, um, so you've got your REM sleep, which you associate a little bit more with higher brain activity. So you don't need to know specific, you know, your alpha, theta, beta, delta, like those things. You just need to understand general brain activity in terms of an increased or decreased frequency, as in the speed at which they occur, or an increased or decreased amplitude, so the height of the waves. So remembering that these would show up on an EEG, um, so in REM sleep, the brain waves that show up on your EEG, they're a little bit faster and a little bit shorter. So increased frequency, decreased amplitude. And that tells us that the brain is kind of working a little bit more. Um, so that's why you kind of associate REM sleep with your sort of brain activity and like mental recovery of the day, um, your brain sort of replenishing. Your NREM sleep um, is forms the bulk of your sleep. Um, NREM sleep one is basically as you, it's almost like a little transitional state, just as you drift into sleep. NREM two is your kind of like typical sleep. And then your NREM three is when you're in lovely, really nice deep sleep. Um, so as you go deeper into sleep, your brain slows down and your frequency decreases and your amplitude increases. So you, when you're awake, when you're in normal waking consciousness, your brain is moving, you know, pretty quickly, increased frequency, and they're very short. So like, mm, I won't draw it out, but like you can imagine with my little finger, right? Um, whereas deep sleep, they're going very slow and very high. Um, so you can kind of imagine it just like slow and high. Like you think of like your brain just like mm, snoozing, you know, drifting through. So that's your deep sleep when your brain isn't really doing much and it's nice and slow. Um, and you think about your NREM sleep to be more so for your physical recovery, just sort of generally is what you think about. Um, but yeah, understand those are your kind of main distinctions. Um, and then you spend most of your time in NREM and REM is the time that you tend to dream as well. So REM stands for rapid eye movement. So your EOG is going to be going off the charts in your REM sleep. 
not going to be moving much in your NREM. Um, your EMG, not used as much, like to differentiate, but your REM sleep, um, it's kind of called paradoxical sleep because your brain is going a little bit faster, but your body is like frozen still. Um, so your EMG shouldn't be showing much in your REM sleep. Whereas your NREM, you can kind of move around a bit more. So if there's a little bit more activity on the EMG, probably more so in NREM. Okay, so differentiating your rhythms, you've got your circadian and your ultradian. So your circadian rhythm goes over 24 hours. So for example, your sleep-wake cycle, you are awake for a couple hours, then you sleep, then you're awake and then you're asleep. And that repeats itself once every 24 hours. Um, your ultradian rhythms, they last less than 24 hours. So you can get more than one of them in a 24 hour period. And that's what we see in our REM and REM kind of alternate when it alternates. Um, so you get your REM, your NREM one, two, three, and then you go your REM and then your NREM, then your REM, then your NREM, then your REM. Um, or I should say it actually starts with your NREM and then your REM. But that idea, and on average, they're about 90 minutes. And then you might have like four, five, six, I don't know, it depends how long you sleep in one sleep episode. So those are your ultradian rhythms because they last for less than 24 hours. Um, in general, so a typical sleep for an adult, your deep sleep will decrease. So you'll get your deep sleep kind of in your first maybe two or three cycles. As you go towards the end of the night, you're not sleeping deeply anymore. So your NREM three, you're getting less of. Um, your REM sleep will increase. So initially at the start, you know, your first two or three cycles, your first two or three ultradian rhythms, you kind of get these like little short periods of REM and towards the end of the night, they increase. Okay. Um, so your suprachiasmatic nucleus, it's kind of association with the pineal gland and the release of melatonin. Very, very important. You have to know this and how, you know, kind of it interacts with light, your zeit gibbers, that sort of thing. So your SCN is part of your hypothalamus. It's just a little area in your brain. Um, and what happens is it will tell the pineal gland what to do and the pineal gland will secrete the melatonin. Um, yeah, that's ultimately the little pathway that we think of. So your SCN basically will either send excitatory messages to the pineal gland or inhibitory messages to the pineal gland based on information that it receives. And it can be influenced by these environmental cues, which are called our light gibbers. Um, so light is the main one that we think about. Um, so your sleep cycle, you sleep at night, you're awake in the day. That's the kind of thing that we look at here. So in your, in your period of waking, so when it's daylight, you're awake because the light is received by, you know, receptors in your eyes and your retina. And then that information gets sent to the SCN. And then the SCN will send inhibitory messages to the pineal gland because it registers like, oh, okay, right now a lot of light is shining into our eyes. Let's stay awake. So I'm going to inhibit the pineal gland and this gland is not going to release melatonin and melatonin is not going to be high. I'm not going to feel sleepy. When it's nighttime, we want to go, to, our body goes to sleep because our retina, you know, there's nothing light isn't detected by the receptors in our eyes. So that information is sent to our SCN and that will send excitatory messages to the pineal gland. And it'll tell the pineal gland, you know, send out the melatonin, release it, time to go to sleep. You'll get high levels of melatonin and you'll feel drowsy. That's the system that we work with there. And you can see how daylight is very important and very influential on your SCN. Um, you can think about as well how blue light is an issue because blue light acts in the exact same way as I've just discussed as daylight, but daylight is really great because it's there when the sun is out and then it's not when the sun is down. Whereas blue light, if you go on your phone, you know, at midnight, it's basically stimulating the sun being there. Um, so your body thinks, Oh my gosh, it's daylight. I need to be awake. And that's why you get, um, decreased melatonin. You know, this whole inhibitory thing will happen. And so that's why, People are discouraged from using devices at night because it can keep you awake. Okay, so demands for sleep across the lifespan. Um, so what Vika needs you to know is the changes in the total amount of sleep and the changes in the sleep pattern. And when it refers to sleep pattern, it just means your REM and your NREM kind of changing. So the total amount of sleep, the trend is that it decreases. So you've got your infants, your babies that have just been born, they sleep for 
ages um, and they'll sleep in different periods. So for a total of 16 hours, but maybe three hours here, four hours there, um, but they sleep for a really long time. Whereas as you basically grow up, you know, younger children, maybe like 11 hours, your adolescents, maybe nine hours, adults, about eight elderly people, about six hours. Um, so as you de as you, sorry, age, your demand for sleep decreases. Um, and you can think about sort of the growing that you're doing when you're an infant, you're growing like crazy. You're growing in your brain, you know, you're growing in your body. So therefore you need a lot of sleep when you're elderly, six hours of sleep is enough because your body isn't growing, you know, like a neonate is. That's the kind of idea there. In terms of your sleep pattern, your REM sleep decreases initially and then stays kind of the same. So as a neonate or as an infant, you're spending about 50% in REM, 50% in NREM. And then kind of like as you're a younger child, it goes to about 25% and then kind of stables out at 20% for the rest of your life. Um, so that's that sort of idea there. And then you can think about NREM in general, we'll do the same thing. So it'll be 50% and then it'll go to about 75, 70%. Um, if you zoom in on those NREM stages, sorry, this should say three, not three and four, ignore four, um, your deep sleep. So your NREM stage three, that will decrease. So elderly people, they don't spend a lot of time, you know, maybe if any, um, in NREM three. So if you get a little hypnogram or if you get a little diagram, like I've seen bar graphs before, if VCAR presents information in any way that says, you know, this person experiences very little NREM three, you can kind of think like, okay, this is quite likely an elderly person. Um, yeah. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's kind of your normal stuff with sleep going onto your sleep deprivation. So this is when we have inadequate quality. So maybe our stages, we're not getting, you know, all of the stages that we're meant to be getting in terms of NREM and REM um, or quantity. So just not getting enough time and therefore not enough REM or NREM, but they lead to these different changes and you have to know it in the context of your effective, your behavioral and your cognitive. Um, so your effective is when we think about our emotions, behavioral, behavioral, cognitive, your sort of thinking. Um, be very, very on top of this stuff because VCA will often sort of segregate them. They'll ask you for specifically ineffective, specifically behavioral, specifically cognitive. So make sure you understand which category they all fit into and that you've got at least two or three memorized from each one. So effective your emotions, you're more irritable. Again, for this, just think about when you don't get enough sleep and what you act like. Um, you're easily irritable. You might be easier to anger when you do anger. It might be this big emotional response that, you know, you might not usually show when you're typically angry. Um, and also it might be harder to judge other people's emotions, your empathy is impaired, that kind of thing. Behavioral, think about your micro sleeps. You've got reduced, um, like motor coordination. So yeah, your hand-eye coordination, that sort of thing. Your reaction time is slowed. Those are things that I tend to write um and your cognitive there's heaps in cognitive so again you can imagine your memory is impaired um your decision making is impaired your problem solving is impaired your focus is impaired your attention is impaired your concentration is impaired like everything cognitive you should have no trouble with um behavioral is sometimes the harder one so just remember at least like two or three um and often with behavioral they always like to ask it in terms of what are the effects that it has on this person's job so that's why like things like reduced motor coordination or slow reaction time um, are good ones because you can kind of describe those in the context of any job. Okay. Um, you have to know it as well, sleep deprivation or partial sleep deprivation in the comparison of your blood alcohol concentration. Um, so there's this little study. These are the results they got. You have to remember 17 hours equals 0 0.05, 24 hours equals 0 0.1 blood alcohol concentration. But importantly understand the context of this they're getting you to learn that 17 hours of sleep deprivation is equal to blood alcohol concentration of 0 0.05 i remember like memorizing like rote learning these numbers and being like okay random but okay but you have to know about them because what they're trying to illustrate with this um is that sleep deprivation can have a really sort of market effect on your driving ability um 
just as much as blood alcohol concentration can. Because when you think about your blood alcohol concentration, you know, when you think about drunk driving, you think about it like it's really bad, you can get really distracted, um, you know, it impairs you a lot. But when you think about someone driving, maybe when they haven't slept for a while, you think like, oh, okay, like, so what? Like if you, you know, if you had a couple drinks, you'd probably be like, oh, no, 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 I'm not going to drive. Whereas if you were really sleep deprived, you'd probably just be like, oh, okay, I'm sleep deprived. Like better focus hard. I'm just going to drive to wherever I need to go to. Um, so that's the idea that they're putting forward with this is that your sleep deprivation can actually impair you to the same level that a blood alcohol concentration can. Um, and that driving when sleep deprived can be very bad, basically. Okay, so looking at your circadian rhythm sleep disorders, exactly what it sounds like. Your circadian rhythm is out of whack. Um, there's a bit of a mismatch between when you should be sleeping and when you are. So either delayed or advanced. Again, it's in the name. Delayed, we're pushing back the sleep cycle. We're pushing back the time that we sleep. We're sleeping later and we're waking up later. Advanced, we're advancing the time that we sleep. We're bringing it forward. We're falling asleep earlier and we're waking up earlier as well. Um, so basically you can think about your melatonin being secreted at a later or at an earlier time. So with your delayed sleep phase syndrome, often you see this with adolescents. Um, naturally, adolescents release their melatonin a little bit later. So that's why, you know, you might feel like you need to go to sleep a little or you feel tired a little bit later. And so you want to wake up a little bit later as well which is fine. Like you can do it when it's school holidays or like work holidays. But if you are sleeping, if you're working, if you have to wake up early and you're going to bed later, you can see how that would lead to sleep deprivation. So that's such a typical question that you get. And then you, you talk about all this stuff as well. I'm sure you guys have answered a billion questions like that, but get used to it because Vicar likes them. Um, your advanced sleep phase disorder, again, your melatonin is secreted a little bit, oh my gosh, secreted a little bit earlier. Um, so again, you're feeling tired earlier and then you're waking up earlier. Shift work, um, basically it'll just depend on when your shift work is. Often you think about it being your night shift. Um, so if your night shift is like every, like you you work at night in a regular routine, that might be a bit easier to adjust to. Um, when you think about, you know, maybe it's two weeks night shift, then two weeks, day shift, you know, that kind of like on and off, like no routine that can be even harder, but in general night shift is hard because of the stuff we talked about with the SCN and melatonin and, and light receptors. Even if you've been working night shift for three years in a row, you've got a nice routine. Um, it's hard to be awake when it's nighttime because of that melatonin level. And it's hard to be asleep when it's daytime. Um, because of that light level and because your melatonin will be lower because basically the environment is telling you, you should be asleep when you're working and you should be awake when you want, when you should be sleeping. Um, so that's why it's really hard. Bright light therapy is used to sort of counteract this or help circadian rhythm sleep disorders um, because it affects that release of melatonin. So if you've got a delayed sleep phase syndrome, you're going to be wanting to fall asleep earlier so you're going to use bright light earlier in the day. Basically, like you want to fall asleep later. And so you want to wake up later. So by using your bright light earlier in the day, it's basically forcing you to wake up early or to be awake early. And being awake early is going to want, your body is going to want to fall asleep earlier, right? So if you're, you've got a delayed sleep phase syndrome, you want to fall asleep at 1 a.m. and wake up at 10 a.m. Um, if you use bright light therapy at 6 a.m., your body's nice and awake by 7, right? Your body is going to want to fall asleep early. Your body, If you are awake at 7, your body isn't going to want to wait until 1 a.m. to sleep. Um, or it shouldn't. That idea of you're kind of like shocking yourself awake in the morning so that you're going to feel tired earlier and bring that sleep cycle forwards. Whereas if it's advanced, you want to do the opposite. You want to push it back. You're going to use light late in the evening. So if you want to go to sleep at 6 p.m. and wake up at, I don't know, whatever that is, plus 8. Like 2 a.m. Okay, maybe 6 p.m. is a bit early, but you get what I'm trying to say. 
you want to you want to fall asleep early in the evening you're going to use bright light therapy later maybe like 4 p.m 5 p.m because that's going to basically like again shock your body awake and you're not going to feel drowsy so early so hopefully if you're using your bright light therapy a little bit later in the afternoon or the evening you're again pushing back that release of melatonin to hopefully like 9 or 10 p.m like a more appropriate time and same with your shift work you know whatever time you want to sleep if you're wanting to bring your sleep cycle phase back, you're going to use bright light therapy in the morning. If you're wanting to push it later, you're going to use it later in the day. Okay, I hope that made sense. I feel like that was a big wordy explanation, but hopefully that is kind of okay. If anything, just pop it in the chat. Moving on to our last area of study. Um, so we're looking at mental well-being. I'll say as well, in the previous study design, it's referred to as mental health. Vika have discussed mental well-being and mental health not being like synonymous, so you can't use them. Yeah, they're not describing the same thing. Um, so just make sure you're using the term mental well-being um, and understand that that's what you're looking at in this area of study. You're not looking at like in previous ones, the emphasis has been a little bit more about, you know, mental health disorders and that sort of thing. Here, it's more about mental well-being, maintaining mental well-being characters like characteristics of mental well-being that sort of thing so more it's more holistic and it's looking at someone a little bit more as a whole so um when we think about this little continuum typically you think about you know it's encompassing mental well-being so you think about you know mental health mental health problem mental health disorder kind of going down this continuum so in general when you think about that with mental well-being it's just this idea of your mental well-being is constantly fluctuating and at one point, you know, it can be really, really high. You can have a really great level of mental well-being. Um, or at some points, it can be pretty low down. Your mental well-being can be pretty low. And that's kind of when you're entering this, yeah, sort of like mental health disorder territory. And understand when we refer to this idea of mental health disorder, it's like a diagnosable condition. Um, it's not just, you know, like having a really bad time for a long period. It's an actual health issue. Um, but yeah, the purpose of referring to mental well-being being on a continuum is this idea of understanding that mental well-being slips and slides as different events happen, as different experiences happen, as you learn and grow as a person, all that sort of stuff, your internal and your external factors. So the stuff that I've just mentioned, you know, relationships, school, work, your external factors, your um, beliefs, your attitudes, your internal factors, you can see how that will determine sort of where you're sitting on this continuum and at what level your mental well-being is sort of sitting at. So we think about it in terms of your functioning and your resilience to life stresses. You can also think about social and emotional well-being, but you, we talk about that more so as the actual framework. Um, but your functioning, functioning is literally such a vague word. It basically covers everything in how a person lives. Um, so it's this idea of being able to function in society as a person. So you're able to be you know, productive, you're able to form relationships, you know, you can engage in communication with people, um, you're able to, you know, complete daily tasks, you can, like, you know, leave, you know, you can keep up with, like, keep up with a to-do list, basically, you know, you can um, provide for yourself, like, you can clean, you can cook, that sort of thing, um, as in, you can just function as an individual and as part of a wider community. In terms of resilience to life stresses, Resilience refers to this idea of just being able to cope with adversity. So if a challenge arises, you're able to deal with it. And very, very importantly, as part of this definition, you're able to sort of get back to where you were and continue on. Um, so, yeah, the opposite of resilience is basically being overwhelmed by issues at hand, you know, dealing with it and not being able to restore that initial function. Yeah, functioning. Um this idea of just yeah, letting stresses overwhelm you, being unable to adapt to and deal with change or deal with uncertainty or deal with stresses. Okay, so in terms of our social and emotional well-being, um, this is referring to a specific framework. And again, we're thinking about this idea of things being holistic. So holistic is this idea of looking at someone as a whole rather than specific like facets of a person's life. Um, so yeah, this idea of looking at the individual person, the characteristics of this individual person, you know, the environment that they're in um, and that sort of thing. 
So again, we apply this specifically sort of in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community and this idea of connections across various domains. So you think about, again, holistic, so covering sort of everything. You're looking at the body, so, you know, your physical health, you're looking at the mind, you're looking at community, you're looking at connection to land, that sort of thing, spirituality, um, the real importance of culture. And it's important that when we're discussing this aspect of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in their communities, um, understanding, especially with mental well-being, this idea of connection to culture and connection to land, when we think about maintenance of mental well-being as well, um, you know, given the like impacts of colonization and that sort of thing and the consequences of that, um, how that feeds into this sort of social and emotional well-being, how it feeds into all these different aspects that we're looking at here in terms of family, you know, in terms of community, in terms of land, this idea of connection to one's family, connection to one's land is very, very important as part of this framework and understanding that, um, you know, there are ramifications and things and effects on colonization that can hamper that. Um, so that's really, really important to understand when you discuss these sorts of things. And also, again, we're thinking about our mental well-being continuum. So it's this idea of you've got your body, your mind, your family, you've got all these different things. It's not that, you know, you have physical health, but, you know, you don't have good, like, community health and that's how it stays forever. It's this idea that, again, internal factors, external factors, one's connection, you know, to mind, to family, to community, it'll vary and it'll, you can kind of think about it sitting along a continuum as well. Okay, moving on to this idea of stress, anxiety and phobia. Again, you can kind of think about the continuum. You can think about defining mental well-being in terms of levels of functioning and that sort of thing. Stress, you should be all over because we've covered that, you know, you've looked at that in unit three. Um, anxiety and phobia. Anxiety, think about when you discuss um, sort of future worries. So it's this idea of like impending doom, kind of um, something in the imminent future that poses a threat, that sort of thing. That's kind of how we differentiate maybe stress and anxiety a little bit. Phobia, again, as we talked about, it's diagnosable. So you diagnose someone to have a specific phobia it's not just you know oh i'm a little bit terrified of this it's an actual you know it has marked effects on someone's life um, and their day-to-day -day functioning that's when we think about you know it's obviously a little bit more extreme than your typical stress and your typical anxiety obviously understanding that you can be diagnosed with an anxiety disorder as well um so stress you think about a little bit more as um kind of it being adaptive you know it can be beneficial and it's extremely normal to experience same with anxiety, it's normal to experience it, you know, sometimes it can be adaptive, but this idea of, you know, same with prolonged stress, but prolonged anxiety or, you know, anxiety can tend to be a little bit more, um, can have more negative effect on functioning. And then again, what we've just discussed with phobia. So this is very, very, very important. Obviously there's a lot of terms here, be on top of them. The way that I remembered them was I would think about how they match up. So you've got your GABA dysfunction, that matches up with your GABA agonists. Um, you've got your stigma that kind of matches up with psychoeducation. Like you've got your cognitive biases that can kind of pair up with CBT, that sort of thing. Um, but as a really brief sort of rundown of this, you've got your GABA dysfunction. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's sort of, you know, what we talked about before, it can calm down the brain. If you have low levels of GABA, you're getting overexcited neurons, you're getting overactivation, and that can precipitate an anxiety response, and that can contribute to specific phobia. Your long-term potentiation, you're basically strengthening the association between fear and your phobic stimuli. Um, in terms of your behavioral models, precipitation means that initial sort of triggering. Perpetuation is maintaining something. So classical conditioning can basically initiate and start a phobia. Again, think about the association of two stimuli um, or fear in this kind of context with a certain phobic stimulus. And then perpetuation, super important to refer to negative reinforcement. Um, it's asked a lot. Negative reinforcement is what we're talking about in perpetuating something via operant conditioning. Um, because you are negatively reinforcing avoidance behaviors. So if I am afraid of spiders, um, let's make it something more like if I'm afraid of dogs, right? Um, 
my friend asks me, let's go to the park, but I'm so nervous that there'll be a dog at the park. So I'm going to say, no, I'm not going to the park. In fact, I'm staying home. That behavior is going to be negatively reinforced because remember negative reinforcement. Negative is we're taking something away. We're taking away the bad feelings of fear, of anxiety, worry. We're taking that away. I like when those you know bad, awful feelings are taken away. So therefore, I'm going to be more likely to do that behavior. I'm going to be more likely to say no to go to the park. I want to be more likely to stay home. I'm going to be more likely to do anything I can to avoid this phobic stimulus. And that's that idea of negative reinforcement. So that's what can perpetuate a specific phobia. Cognitive biases, we think about um, sort of your memory bias. So I'm more inclined to remember the negative memories I have with this stimulus as opposed to the positive. Um, and also this idea of catastrophic thinking. I'm more inclined to think about the really bad things that can go wrong. So I'm going to go to this dog park. I'm going to see a dog. It's going to run off his leech. It's going to bite me. It's going to kill me. That idea. You can see that that's very unlikely. Like statistically, that's very unlikely. But this catastrophic thinking, this bias that I have makes me think, this is very probable, you know, it's probably going to happen. Your social contributing factors, your specific environmental triggers, kind of similar to classical conditioning. Vika will definitely include terms that will separate them. So you have to just look for them. You know, if you're looking for something to do with like pairing or if you see something about like an unconditioned stimulus, that sort of thing, that'll cater you more towards classical conditioning. If you see one thing where it's just there was this really bad event, you know, had really bad feelings and then Ever since then, you've had this phobia. That's kind of a little bit more specific environmental trigger. Um, and then stigma. So just this idea that, you know, you're embarrassed, your friends and your family will judge you, they won't understand you. That's going to make me less likely to seek treatment for my phobia. That's going to perpetuate it. Okay, moving on to your interventions, you've got your GABA agonists. So these are benzodiazepines medication that will basically stimulate the effect of GABA. Um, so that's what an agonist is. It kind of increases the effect of that. Um, so then those higher levels of GABA are restored, basically. Your breathing retraining. Um, when you have a stress response, you can think, you know, you get really panicky. Um, so your breathing retraining is helpful in terms of calming you down. You know, it can calm down the sympathetic nervous system. Those long, those deep breaths, it can prevent that hyperventilation, that sort of thing. Cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive aspect is replacing harmful thoughts that lead to your behavior, sorry, that lead to your phobia. And behavior is fixing and replacing maladaptive behaviors, you know, such like those avoidance behaviors, replacing them with more helpful ones. Systematic desensitization um, is your three step process. So it's when you think about your hierarchy. If you see anything to do with, you know, so-and-so is drawing up a hierarchy. So-and-so is making a list of things from most fearful to least fearful, like systematic desensitization automatically. Um, so the first thing is you are taught a relaxation technique. So often breathing retraining. So the individual is taught how to breathe properly, calm down, this sort of thing. The second thing they do is make that hierarchy. So you make a little list of, I've got things from, you know, most fearful or least fearful to most fearful in terms of my phobic stimulus. The third thing is pairing one and two together. So you work through this hierarchy um, and each step along the way, you're pairing it with this breathing retraining. So the, the mildest one may be like seeing a picture of a dog or seeing a drawing of a dog. So that's going on and I'm going to pair this with my breathing retraining, my other relaxation technique, and I'm going to try and feel really, really calm, you know, use my breathing retraining until I feel confident that this doesn't sort of incite this fear response and then I'm going to move on. So it's very much, you have to like complete the level before you get to the next one. You can't just like go, okay, one, two, three, four, five and move up. You need to feel completely confident and sort of like, I don't know, at peace with the one on the bottom before you move on to the next one. And then obviously you get up to the top and then the goal of it is to sort of eradicate that fear response and replace it with this really calmed relaxation one. Okay. And then the last one, it is very content heavy slide, um, is psychoeducation. So it's basically, again, the opposite of stigma. Um, when you teach and when you 
educate in this specific context the family or the friends of the individual that's got the specific phobia um, and telling them basically to discourage these avoidance behaviors that we've talked about to challenge these unrealistic thoughts um, and in turn that's obviously going to help the person with the specific phobia okay I hope that all made sense please let me know if there are any questions um, kind of along these last dot points we're looking at maintaining mental well-being. So kind of discussing mental well-being and obviously looking at specific phobia. Here's when we're talking about maintaining a high level of it. Um, so in terms of this idea of, you know, First Nations communities, that sort of things, looking at cultural continuity and self-determination are really important because understanding that um, cultural determinants of health are really, really important, especially for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, so cultural continuity is this idea of basically, again, as it sounds like in the name, preserving the traditions of one culture, you know, maintaining the teaching of this culture, things like that. Um, and obviously that links into social and emotional well-being. You know, we saw that little domain of culture there. So this importance of passing down traditions, you know, passing on information and education, um, that's really important in maintaining mental well-being also linked very closely with that is this idea of self-determination so again as it sounds in the name having the power having the resources having the ability to kind of initiate this sort of connection um so understanding that you know first nations people have this ability to almost yet yeah, preserve historical traditions that kind of thing of linking it with cultural continuity um so this idea of you know welcome to country ceremonies traditional forms of healing lots of other different examples that allow um yeah first nations communities to preserve that culture and to engage in kind of behaviors that allow this maintenance of mental well-being that maybe aren't so heavily emphasized in like typical sort of western medicine or um you know western systems um so that's very important as well on top of that, looking again at your biopsychosocial approach, super, super important in this area of study, you're looking at your biological is very straightforward, basically eating well, drinking enough and sleeping well. Um, it just, you know, allows your biological functioning and also understanding how that in, impacts your mental well-being. Um, looking at your social, so cognitive behavioral strategy. So again, thinking about your CBT, um, this idea of replacing any maladaptive or negative thoughts or behaviors that can harm your mental well-being and replacing them with ones that are more beneficial mindfulness meditation i'm sure you guys are pretty aware of this i feel like they do it a lot in school um but mindfulness is basically focusing your awareness on the present moment or the present time being very in tune while you're doing the meditation practice um of the emotions that you're kind of going through you know, often you focus on breathing or you do a body scan, that sort of thing. It's just bringing your attention, you know, and your mind is usually in a thousand places at once, just bringing it to sort of one thing, you know, looking at your body or like tuning into your body, that sort of thing, um, tuning into your mind and kind of focusing on one thing, bringing your awareness to one thing. And that sort of promotes mental well-being and that you become more aware of how you feel and how you think. Your social support obviously pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, having support from your community, having support from your family and friends, building a strong support network is really important, particularly in times when your mental well-being is declining a little bit and getting support from those sources. Okay, we are probably going to race through this in the last couple minutes of the lecture. It's super important. I'll highlight the terms that are the most important, but do not ignore your area of study three don't delay you know studying for your research methods i understand and because i felt the same way like i hated it like i always thought it was super boring um but it's really important and it can form a pretty heavy part of your exam you know often there might be a lot of it in your 10 marker as well so it's really important to have a good grasp on the sort of stuff that we'll discuss and an experimental setup in general um, so your independent and your dependent variable, very important to understand your IV is what you are changing. Your DV is what you're measuring. And remembering that the entire purpose of your experiment is to figure out the relationship between the IV and the DV. It's the whole like reason 
why we're here. You know, you're trying to figure out what the relationship is, how it affects the DV, in what way, to what extent. All the other terms that we'll discuss, you know, extraneous variables, validity, reliability, all that is all part of and is all contributing to your ability to figure out how the IV affects the DV. So your extraneous, oops, sorry, your extraneous variable um, is basically when your extraneous, you're confounding, they're very similar. Your extraneous is a variable that has the potential to affect the DV in an unwanted way. Confounding variable is something that has had that effect. So an extraneous variable is this idea of, um, you know, you might have these variables and they can affect the DV. So pay, um, oh my gosh, potentially things like, um, like socioeconomic status or, you know, memory, um, IQ, obviously it depends on the study that you're doing, but those sorts of things. And often you think about them being characteristics of the participants, like what I've just discussed, those can be extraneous variables. A confounding variable is when it has had an effect. Um, so if you haven't controlled for these variables, maybe you're trying to figure out if you're doing like a drug trial, maybe how this drug affects Alzheimer's, right? Um, and maybe how it affects memory, but a confounding variable may be you have people um, that are in different sort of spectrums of Alzheimer's. You know, one may have been diagnosed yesterday. You've got one who's had Alzheimer's for 10 years. You know, you've got one that's got really rapidly progressing Alzheimer's. Like that is obviously going to have an effect on this study and the dependent variable. And that's something that you haven't controlled for. Um, your sub, your, oh my gosh experimental designs that you have a look at you've got your between subjects within subjects and your mixed design so again very much in the name also understanding these are new for this study design so if you see previous exam resources that don't discuss these and discuss different types of methodologies um, just ignore those questions because they aren't relevant in the study design between subjects um, is when you have subjects that are allocated to different groups. So they're all in different conditions. They're all part of different um, like trials almost. With your within subjects, you've got one group of participants um, and they're exposed to both the control and the experimental. So they're exposed to the group with the IV and without the IV. Mixed design is just what it sounds like. You've got elements of both. So maybe there are parts of it where some of the subjects are in, you know, mutually exclusive different conditions, whereas, you know, maybe for some parts or some tasks, they do the same thing or they, you know, are exposed again to the IV and without the IV. So it'll tell you and you just have to pick up whether they're separated the whole time, whether they're together the whole time or whether they're, you know, is a little bit of a mix of both. Um, you've got your experimenter effect in your standard instruction. So experimenter effect is basically when the experimenter can be a little bit biased and they can knowingly or unknowingly affect the results by kind of giving hints to your participants um, or, you know, interpreting data in a bit of a biased way. Your standardized instructions and procedure can kind of help for this. It's just everyone needs to experience the conditions in the same way. So by giving everyone the same instructions by having everyone perform the task in the exact same way. Again, you're avoiding any extraneous variables. Um, you're single blind and you're double blind. So your double blind is kind of the goal in which your participants and your experimenter don't know what condition they're in. You know, they don't know whether they're in the control group or the experimental group. And again, that can diminish participant expectations. It can diminish the bias that both participants and the experimenter may have if they know what group they're in. So if you've got your your control group and your experimental group and it's for a drug trial, um, if you know that you are part of the group that's receiving the drug, you're expecting to get better. So you may report better symptoms. You may feel like you feel better even if you don't. Whereas the group that doesn't get the drug, if they know that they're not getting the drug, they're going to expect that they're not feeling better. Even if they feel a little bit better for whatever reason, they might report that they don't because they're not expecting to. Um, and single blind is basically when you've just got one group that is blinded and one group that's aware. As in the experimenter is aware when the participants are blinded, or maybe vice versa. Okay, in terms of your sampling, um, the goal of your sampling is to achieve a representative sample. So by using random sampling and stratified sampling, that's how you're going to achieve that. 
Um, and when I say representative, it means that the experiment that I'm doing on 100 Victorians, this sample of 100 Victorians is representative of the entirety of Victoria. Everyone's represented in a good way. It's not this small sample that's biased and only shows, um, you know, people of a certain age or people of a certain demographic. Um, and that's obviously not going to be representative of the whole population. So random sampling is that everybody in the population has an equal chance of being selected. Stratified is I'm choosing the number of people in accordance with how, with their proportions in the group. So if in the population of Victorians, if I've got double the amount of 50 year olds as 60 year olds in my sample, I'm going to have double the amount of 50 year olds as I do 60 year olds. Okay. Allocation is also really important and this can diminish your individual participant variables. Now I've got my sample of a hundred people. I've got my experimental group and my control group. I'm going to allocate them randomly. Again, if it's not randomly, you might have the experimental group that tends to be all of a similar demographic and the control group that are all of a similar demographic and that, you know, can introduce changes, unwanted effects in your DV, extraneous variables, that sort of thing. Um, so allocating them randomly is really important and understand the difference between sampling and allocation. Sampling is drawing your group of participants from the wider population. Allocation is I've got the participants, I'm putting them in this group or that group, allocating. Um, so don't get confused on those two. Okay, so qualitative and quantitative should be pretty straightforward. So qualitative, you're thinking of more descriptions. Quantitative, quantity, you're thinking more numerical data. Quantitative is often better because it's less prone to bias. However, especially in psychology, qualitative data is still extremely very useful. Um, so the mean, again, I'm sure you guys will be familiar on this, hopefully, just the average. So they, they could get you to calculate the mean. They won't get you to do anything that requires a calculator or that's really extreme. Um, but you just have to add everything together and then divide it by the number of values that you have. Your standard deviation, um, basically the goal here is you want what you've got here on the left. You want a small standard deviation because that tells you a standard deviation basically measures, you've got your mean, what we've just talked about. So kind of the average of the group, it measures how far from the average were the results. So if you've got, you know, people reporting how much their memory improved, if the mean is five points, but you've got some people who whose memory improved by a hundred points, some people whose memory declined by a hundred points, you know, so IE you've got a really large standard deviation. You're kind of thinking about, mm, that's really odd. That's really strange. Something's probably gone wrong. Whereas if you have a nice small standard deviation, you know, the average is an increase by five points, you know, the max might be by like 10 points. The minimum might be by like three points or something, but most of them are clustered really nicely around this five points. That's good because it tells you, okay, it's kind of affected people all in the same way. Um, and that's what you should expect to get if your experiment is pretty good. So your repeatability and your reproducibility, very similar. Your repeatability is kind of in the here and now, I'm repeating this measurement over and over in the same conditions with the same people and getting the same results. Reproducibility is at a different time with different people, I'm reproducing this entire experiment. Um, so you can see how reproducibility is a little bit on a wider scale. Repeatability is just, you know, a smaller measurement and repeatability is the same person, the same time. Reproducibility is kind of different people, different environment, different conditions, different time. Um, and your validity that refers to basically how robust your experiment is. Um, so what that means is kind of, did you actually figure out the relationship between the IV and the DV? Did you figure out what you wanted to figure out? Um, so you can refer to kind of equipment like this, like this is an example of that, but in the context of psychology, you're often referring to it in terms of your experiment. My experiment where I'm trying to test this drug on Alzheimer's, um, have I actually tested what I'm meant to test? Have I designed the experiment? Have I, you know, done this ethically? Have I minimized confounding and extraneous variables so that the results that I've gotten are actually 
appropriate, you know, I've actually figured out the IV and the DV. That's what validity kind of refers to. Um, generalizing something and making generalizations basically means that your what you found in your sample, you can say that this would be true of the rest of Victoria. So again, your sample has to be representative, that sort of thing, no ethical guidelines, no confounding variables. Um, basically, I'm saying in this population of 100 Victorians, this result has been achieved. You know, my Alzheimer's drug works amazingly. Can I say that it'll work in my population of Victorians with Alzheimer's? That's the idea of making a generalization. Um, okay, quickly cycling through ethics. Um, you basically have your, you know, general things, your privacy, your respect, integrity, that sort of thing. Um, important ones to remember your voluntary participation. You can't coerce someone to be in your experiment. At the same time, you can't punish someone for leaving. So voluntarily entering voluntarily and, you know, within their rights, being able to leave as well. That's really important. So think about like entry and exit are really important things we have to worry about ethics. Um, super important. Arguably the most important ethical principle, informed consent. They have to know what the experiment is about, what it entails, what the risks are, what it's for. Obviously, if you use deception, you can um, omit certain details, but you obviously have to disclose that after. Um, but informed consent is very, very important. Deception is what we've just discussed. So again, you can deceive someone or withhold some information. You have to do it ethically. You have to receive permission and it can't be something very, very um, like harmful. Like the deception can't lead to psychological trauma, obviously. Um, debriefing is what happens after study. Importantly, debriefing happens after every study. I think it's a common misconception that debriefing only happens after deception. Even if I don't use deception in my experiment, you have to debrief the results. You have to tell the participants, you know, what you found, what's gone on, all this sort of stuff. Okay, that is it for scientific skills. Please let me know if you have any specific questions on exam strategies or feel free to email me. I'll cycle through some of these really quickly. Um, but I'm sure you know by now, psych is a lot of content. Hopefully you've picked up on a way to memorize it that works for you. Um, writing notes is helpful, but be concise. Um, I think that's what I learned when I was again in year 11. So it was my first three, four, I had to figure out what worked for me and what didn't practice questions are really, really important. Be concise with your notes, stick to the study design, use the study design to guide your notes. I used the textbook to guide my notes and it can sometimes be a waste of time if the textbook includes a lot of unnecessary information and in chapters. So I would recommend to use the study design as a guide to your notes. Like just use the study design dot point. And then in the page below, pages below, you write about the study design dot point as opposed to chapter one notes, chapter two notes. That's what I would recommend. Um, and practice questions are really vital, especially with psych. It's all application. Always use the person's name in your short answer as well. And just be specific to the context. Um, on exam day, yeah, I personally went multiple choice, short answer, your 10 marker, figure out what works for you, do practice exams and figure out which order works, which order doesn't. I would recommend doing the short answer last because it can be very easy to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and then run out of time for your section A, run out of time for your section B. That was for me personally. If you're not much of a talker and you get through the 10 marker and get through it well, maybe you'd prefer to do it first. Um, but just practice and figure out what works for you. Um, in terms of the 10 marker, I said about 30 minutes for it. Please, if there's one thing you do, make a plan and also use subheadings. This is something that Vika has said in terms of paragraphing. I personally paragraphed. I don't think I wrote subheadings, but subheadings can make things clearer. So either paragraph and or, you know, use subheadings, but let there be flow, let there be logical kind of progression through your 10 marker. Because if you just write your 10 marker in one big block and just throw in any things you think are relevant, it's so hard to read. Maybe your points are really good, but the examiner will literally get a headache trying to read through this humongous block of writing that has no order, no structure. So really work on your structure. It's basically like writing a mini essay. Um, 
so write things so they have a flow um yes that'll probably be my biggest tip after the exam congratulations you've completed the exam i know psych is fairly early on in the exam period um be mindful like give yourself time to relax obviously if you've got an exam the next day or if you're you know you've got a couple of exams around that period um you need to study for it but just give yourself some time because you don't want to burn out during the exam period um you don't want to exhaust yourself when you know you've got a couple to go and also i would suggest trying not to talk too much about the exam it just makes you anxious it just makes you think about it like um you know if you talk about it too much and it makes you think like oh i wish i did this i wish i did that but like you can't do anything about it so i would suggest like after your exam just you know leave you know maybe i don't know go eat something with your friends but don't talk about the exam i know it's super hard and i think i tried to do that but i didn't end up doing that um but just do your best to avoid talking or like make a pact with your friend like after this exam we're not going to talk about it and then you can go with your friend and go do something um but yeah, it just makes you anxious for no reason. Okay, sorry for going a little bit over time. Hopefully that has been helpful. Thank you guys so much for watching this. Again, I hope you've benefited from it. Please feel free to email me again. It's just lordes at tutesmart.com if there's anything that you want to clarify from this or anything that you'd like me to explain a little bit further. I know this is pretty rapid. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I give you my best of luck for your exams. You guys will all do really well. Again, it's not the be all and the end all. The psych exam isn't, year 12 isn't. And I know it's easier said than done to not put so much pressure on yourself. Um, but yeah, good luck with everything. I'm sure you guys will all get to where you want to be at the end of the year. Thanks, guys.